My name is Freddy Petrelli. I'm the executive director of the Guatemalan Forensic Anthropology Foundation. We're an organization that focuses on identifying the victims of the, of the conflict in Guatemala. And uh, we use a multidisciplinary approach that goes from uh, a family-oriented approach, uh, archaeology, anthropology, and genetics. Well, my role is, I mean, I created the organization and I've uh, managed to incorporate new sciences. So, for example, for many years we worked only uh, with archaeology, then forensic anthropology. We brought in cultural anthropologists and psychologists to be able to uh, gain the family's trust and have more access into their stories and what they were going through. And then later when we began to look at the possibility of working with uh, the disappeared or looking for the disappeared, we had to incorporate DNA. And my role has been that of a, a fundraiser, a, a technical leader sometimes, and at times just uh, knowing how to pick the right team and let the experts get to work. I mean, in my case, uh, the organization goes back to when I got involved, and I got involved um, in 1995. I mean, I grew up in New York, and then I uh, met Dr. Clyde Snow, and Dr. Clyde Snow had started efforts like the one in Guatemala and Argentina and in Chile. And he came to Guatemala in December of 1990 uh, to review an autopsy file of the killing, the, the murder of uh, Myrna Mack, who was a very uh, renowned anthropologist and who had discovered that there was wrongdoing in the, in the killing of the indigenous population, and she was assassinated for it. So Clyde Snow, with the help of Physicians for Human Rights, came and started looking, and then he realized really quickly that something else was going on in Guatemala and that uh, there was a, lot, a need for forensics. When he started working, I mean, the crime scenes weren't documented properly. There was very little knowledge of, of the human skeleton or of what it meant to recover or exhume uh, bodies from a grave, how to document them as a crime scene, and forget about the process of identifying someone. That was just uh, not important. And then not only was it not important, because people were afraid of the perpetrators, but it was not important because the victims were indigenous. So racism had a lot to do with the way forensics started in Guatemala. Uh, it wasn't until Dr. Snow began a process of training and then eventually replicated what he had done in Argentina, which is got a young group of uh, anthropologists together to form a small organization. At the time it was 1992, and it was called the Guatemalan Forensic Anthropology Team. I joined in 95, and that's when we realized that we needed to be a little more um, visionary, understand a little more about what we were doing. Uh, at the time, we had no idea that there were 200,000 victims. Uh, so it was one case at a time. And eventually, we decided that we needed a more of a formal organizative structure, and we formed the foundation in 97. And from then on, we began working with the Truth Commission, um, doing more cases, till eventually we get to a place in time when we decide that we must start looking for the, the victims of disappearances. The difference is, the victims of the massacres, everyone knew where they were buried. A lot of times, the families buried them themselves, so they knew exactly which grave, which family was in, but they disappeared. These are people that were just abducted, captured, uh, illegally detained from their homes, from their places of work, from their schools, from the street, and they were never seen again. And we didn't really know where the bodies were. And that's when Dr. Snow asked, you know, maybe they could be at the cemeteries. And that's when we began to look inside the cemeteries. And at the same time, we started running into petitions from the prosecutor asking us to go into former military bases. When we went into these former military bases, former or current military bases, then we started finding mass graves inside the military bases. No one knew who was in those mass graves. The majority of the victims are men of uh, fighting age, let's say, 18 to 35 years old. And in that process, we needed new tools. And that's how you know, DNA became so important to us. The work we had done in the Balkans, in Bosnia, in the late 90s, had also taught us that in large scale human rights abuses, uh, massive disappearances, 
well, there was a new tool, and that new tool was, was DNA. So after seeing what happened in, in New York in, in the World Trade Center in 9-11, not the event, of course, that, that affected everyone, especially New Yorkers, uh, but the entire U.S., but the way people rallied around searching for the bodies and the way that there was so much, so many resources invested in recovering every small part of every body made me, you know, and being a New Yorker as well, also realize that we should do more in Guatemala. And I, in my own mind, I started thinking, you know, a New Yorker is not worth more than a Guatemalan. There's no reason why we can't do the same. So the idea was to create a system that would do the most we could to find every last person that went missing. And that's our goal. The, our goal is to, to search, to give the families hope, to attempt everything we can do to find, find the bodies, find the truth about what happened, and allow the families to, to have some, some dignity, some, we don't say closure anymore, we say empowerment. But in that process is to learn of what happened so then they can make choices with their life afterwards. Well, unfortunately, one, one of the biggest challenges for us, besides all of the technical ones, is the fact that since we're an NGO, we rely on, on donations. And, and that is a huge challenge because the resources are just simply not there. We get uh, absolutely no contr contributions from within Guatemala, um, from the state, for example. This is work that the state should be supporting. And, you know, because there's still people that participated in a lot of these crimes in positions of power, then what we do is sort of taboo in Guatemala and we're not supported. And we have been supported uh, through our history by uh, friendly governments, uh, the Netherlands, Sweden, the United States even. I guess for me the most rewarding is to be able to change Guatemala one family at a time. Um, I do believe that we have empowered many families and I am very hopeful that someday these families will become replicators of this and will support other families. It's beginning to happen, but just to be able to, to see peace in someone's eyes after decades of not knowing, after decades of searching, it's, it's you know, it, it, it humbles you. It humbles you and, and makes you realize that you are, you have huge responsibility and that you are very fortunate. I'm very fortunate. I love what I do and I, I, would, I don't think I could do anything else. And uh, I chose it as much as it chose me. And Clyde, Clyde Snows, would be responsible for that. But um, uh, we've come to the conclusion that this is, this is what I should be doing and I, I'm very happy with it. I, I guess the one thing that's important to understand is that Guatemala just happens to be one country that's almost a neighbor of the U.S., you know, right after Mexico. But the things that, are hap that happened in Guatemala 30 years ago are happening now. They're happening in Mexico right next door. Um, there's, a, you know, the migrants that have gone missing. This is an issue that's not going to disappear. And we should focus on understanding what it creates and the weight it creates for society as a whole. So we shouldn't turn our head and look the other way just because people are not the same skin color or speak the same language. And understand that this, a lot of these crimes are violations against humanity, against humans in general. And that providing assistance, providing support, providing donations, whatever it, you can provide to investigate these these crimes or, or these uh, situations will go a long way with the people that, that are suffering the most. And I think that's important to remember.